Live from Seattle, Washington, it's The Cube at Tableau Conference 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Tableau. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Kelly. Welcome back, everybody. We are here live at the Tableau Conference 2014 in Seattle, Washington. I'm Jeff Kelly with Wikibon. You're watching The Cube. Um, of course, a big theme here at the Tableau Conference has been the partner ecosystem that's developed around Tableau as, as, the, as Tableau has become um, much more popular than the enterprise. Uh, you know, they built out this partner strategy, both from an OEM perspective, from a database perspective. Uh, today, at this, in this segment, we're going to be talking with MarkLogic. Joe Pasqua is here. He's the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Product Management at MarkLogic. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So, yeah, as I was just saying, clearly uh, Tableau has built out their partner strategy, their partner ecosystem. Um, it's important to them. Talk a little bit about Mark Logic and kind of wh wh why are you guys here? What are you, what are you doing with Tableau and kind of what's your relationship with uh, the company? Great, yeah, Tableau is a great partner for us. We are the only enterprise NoSQL database out there and given that we're in with enterprise customers, uh, tools like Tableau are extremely important to them to get the most out of their data. So we've been working really hard with Tableau and they've been a great partner for us in sort of coupling together uh, visualization, telling the story of data with the NoSQL world where we come from. People tend to think more of BI and visualization for the, for the strictly structured world, mm -hmm. uh, but we've been sort of going beyond that with Tableau and trying to get the value from all of our customers' data rather than just the, the sort of strictly, rigidly structured data. There was a lot in that answer that I want to get to. Okay. So let's start with the, you, you described Mark Logic as enterprise NoSQL. And so NoSQL, people think about, I think some of the things to think about as well, you know, it's good to experiment with NoSQL, it's doing some cutting edge stuff, but it's not necessarily enterprise. So what do you mean by enterprise NoSQL? What is that, that's a loaded term, what does that right. mean from Mark right. Logic's perspective? That's a, it's a really good question because a lot of people throw that term around. They do. Um, so, so what it means for us, particularly coming from the database space, is we kind of look at the history of, of databases and we look at kind of the capabilities and the characteristics that people have come to expect from their systems. You know, when, when somebody's buying a traditional um, RDBM, RDBMS system, they expect acid transactions, mm -hmm. they expect high availability, they expect DR, they expect point in time recovery. There's this whole plethora of things that people have come to rely on over the past 30 years in the, in the database space. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what happened in the NoSQL world was, hey, we want to break with the relational world. We want to do something new and different. We want to be more agile, which is wonderful. Um, but they, they kind of gave up on a lot of those capabilities that people had come to expect over the years um, as part of getting to this more agile um, platform. And our model has really been, um, no, we, we want that agility, we want the power that comes with NoSQL, but we're not willing to compromise mm -hmm. on the capabilities that customers have come to depend on. Because, as I said, we focus on the enterprise space. So there's all these great functional characteristics that people want from their database, but there's all these non-functional characteristics that they want as well, and those are just important to us. So, so that, that's really where we're coming from is, is having all of the agility and power that people associate and ease that people associate with NoSQL, but not giving up on mm -hmm. kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater on yep. those other features. So, okay, so that sounds fantastic, but how do you go about doing that? What's right. your secret sauce? How do you actually, how do you actually do that without all that functionality without having to sacrifice some of those enterprise great right, capabilities? Right. So um, th there's a couple of things related to that, and one is we've been doing this for over a decade. So, so and, and this is true for everybody. I mean, I, I worked at Oracle when they were a tiny company. I saw what we went through from an engineering perspective to get from being the new guy and the small guy to the trusted, this stuff is really baked and really works. And frankly, part of it is it takes time. It takes time to, it takes years to harden this stuff and really you know, figure out all the edge cases and work through them and, and be able to get to the point where you, you can make it work at all and have those capabilities. So we've had the benefit of time, that's one thing. The other piece of it really has to do with 
um, the notion that we went in with that as a design point. Mm -hmm. So when we started, we didn't say, okay, we want to have all the agility and then we'll figure out how to do the other stuff. We went into the picture saying, okay, we have to have asset transactions, for example. That's not something we're going to compromise on. So in building the system, how can we do that knowing that we want that to be the case? So we start with technologies and say, okay, well, we, we know we need to have MVCC, mm -hmm. um, multi-version concurrency control, built in from day one. And then build the scale-out platform and the technologies based on that decision that we've already made. So it's, um, it's possible, it's not easy, but it's possible if you sort of design in advance knowing those are the characteristics that you want to go after and building the technologies around that rather than trying to retrofit. Right, I think, and that stands in contrast to some of the other NoSQL databases that have been built out there, which I think were, were more developer focused in the sense that they were from developers who were trying to solve a specific problem, and they weren't thinking about building a, an enterprise product, really. They were thinking about, you know, a, a, a solution to a specific problem, and then after the fact, as companies developed to commercialize those databases, well now, we've, oh boy, we need to add all these enterprise grade capabilities, and that's what you see happening now in terms of all the, uh, a lot of R&D going into that, and the, into the new crop of NoSQL companies. Exactly. But you mentioned you've been around for a while, so you're kind of ahead of, ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. Um, what was really the, the genesis of MarkLogic? Was, what was the um, kind of the driving factor in its founding? So, so MarkLogic uh, was founded by a guy who came from the search world. And uh, he was around, you know, in the, in the 2000 time period looking at search technology and web search technologies and asking the question that we all ask, which is, why is it so much easier to find stuff on the internet than it is to find in your own organization? And he really set about solving that problem. And in trying to solve that problem, he realized that there needed to be a different way of storing and organizing your data. And as he kind of went down that path and built out that architecture, realized that what you really need is a database to do that. Mm -hmm. So it came from this world that said, we want to start with search. We want to be able to, fundamentally we were about finding answers and giving better answers. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is with database technology combined with search technology. So that, that was really the genesis uh, for Mark Logic and, so, and was um, some of the core design decisions that went into getting us in the direction that we're on today. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that to, in terms of your sweet spot uh, for the applications that you support. What is really, because we hear NoSQL is a broad category and there's different, as I mentioned, a whole different slew of databases cropping up for specific use cases. What is MarkLogic's sweet spot? Yeah, I think, I think there are two areas where people use us over and over and over again and get a lot of value from us. The first is in content delivery. And we've had you know, very long time uh, customers who are in the publishing industry, the media industry. They're people who want to take diverse pieces of content from lots of different sources, put it together, and um, be able to uh, search it, either have their users search it or search it dynamically to construct new content that's composed of all of these uh, different uh, component content pieces that they have in their database. Mm -hmm. So content delivery, publishing, media, really a sweet spot for us historically. As the company's grown, we found that um, there's another class of application uh, that's very common for us and a sweet spot for us, and that's in uh, content data, uh, uh, heterogeneous data integration. Okay. And what I mean by that is you've got organizations that have tons of different data, tons of different formats in lots of different systems, and now either out of necessity or out of desire, they want to take all that data, bring it together, and um, get value out of the answers that they can only get by bringing the data together. Mm -hmm. And what we find is the applications and the, the way people talk about them may be very, very different, but the underlying problem is the same. So just for example, you take a company that wants to, very large company, wants to have a 360 view of their employees. I just want to know about my employees. Um, but my data's in 20, 30 different HR systems or other related systems, mm -hmm. and I simply can't do it. I, there's no way I can get a 360 view of my own employees. And so 
companies like that are coming in, they're bringing in Mark Logic and saying, okay, you guys are schema agnostic, you guys can pull data from all these different systems, whether it's structured or unstructured or polystructured, bring it together in one place and get the 360 view of the data there. Mm -hmm. Similar kind of thing, very different application in uh, regulatory compliance. So now you've got these large financial institutions that need to be able to look at their risk across all of their, their different systems, whereas previously they needed to have a Chinese wall between these mm -hmm. things. Now it's like, hey, you've got to give us kind of a view of your overall risk status right. across the bank. So again, same kind of thing, lots of different systems, lots mm -hmm. of diverse data, how do you bring it all together? And the interesting thing in some of those cases is Yes, the data is heterogeneous, but it may all be in relational database systems. They might mm -hmm. have tw literally 20 different um, you know, Sybase instances that have their data, they can't integrate it. They're using Mark Logic to take that heterogeneous data, bring it together, then they might be bringing together other information that's not coming from their systems. External information, what's going on in the markets, uh, non-structured information to give that overall mm. risk view. So, so it's really about bringing together different sources of data and different types of data to give a, um, a more holistic view uh, and, mm -hmm. and answers that they couldn't get before. So it, it sounds a little bit like the, similar to the mission or what we hear about from enterprise data warehouse vendors, but they have the challenge of fitting that into a very strict model where you can't bring in these different sources, especially if it's unstructured or semi-structured data, or even if it's all structured, but different models. You've got to massage, do a lot of massaging to make that work. That's exactly right. And that's the path a lot of these organizations go down is, well, well, we'll have an enterprise data warehouse or we'll have a logical data warehouse. And okay, step one, create a schema that describes all of the data in these 20 systems plus the one that somebody remembers next week mm -hmm. that you need to include plus the external data sources right. and they give up. And that, right, and that's why we see so many uh, EDW projects stall out at a certain point where they just never achieve their vision. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Tableau. We're here at the, the Tableau conference. So uh, I can certainly see the fit for Tableau um, with MarkLogic, visualizing some of those insights, visualizing some of the, uh, the content. Can you talk a little bit about um, what some of your customers, your joint customers are doing together? Yeah, great example actually that uh, Tableau demoed at our user conference not too long ago um, uh, was uh, Founders Online. This is a system that, um, it was actually a, a combination of um, uh, some government entities and University of Virginia put together to make available all the writings of the Founding Fathers. Um, awesome website, you can go there, find anything you want, uh, all the writings of the Founding Fathers, look through them, it's really great. What Tableau did is they came along and they looked at that and said, this is fantastic, but um, we can actually do more with this data than just kind of allowing you to search it and, and read through it. There's quantitative aspects of this data too. Mm. Um, you can look at George Washington and you can not only find what he's written, but you can look at what was his writing level over time. Gee, he was turning out you know, these many types of writings. Well, all of a sudden it dropped off. Well, the Revolutionary <laughs> War started and he was busy being a general. Um, and you, you can get these insights from this system and then have Tableau sitting side by side with the other system. So you can do these awesome visualizations, really tell the story of what was going on there, but then drill down and say, okay, well, let's see specifically what was going on at that time and what the writings were about, and then take it directly into uh, the Founders Online website. So it wasn't this model where you have this visualization over here and this other data over here. It's really mm -hmm. very nicely integrated uh, in a way that brought together the unstructured data with the, with the sort of numerical data, the scalar data, uh, and tied it together really nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is your take on uh, Tableau in the wider BI market? So you know, as a database provider, you probably got customers using other BI tools, You've, you're probably very familiar with, you know, Oracle's got their line, sure. SAP and others. How does Tableau fit? I mean, they, when they emerged, they really obviously positioned themselves as kind of a modern alternative to the legacy BI providers, but they've grown up a lot and they've had a lot of enterprise grade capabilities themselves. Um, how do you see that market today? Is Tableau still disrupting uh, those existing players and, and what's the, that dynamic look like? Yeah, I, I think if you look at the, at the show floor today and, and the talks and the interest level of what's going on, 
uh, it, it's sort of inescapable that uh, Tableau is still really driving tremendous interest in this marketplace. And, and really, you know, I, I was sitting at lunch at a table with a bunch of people I didn't know today and just kind of listening to the conversations they, that were going on. And the, the, the consistent thing amongst those people was, you know, this is really allowing us to tell this story with our data um, that, that we didn't know we could do um, and we didn't think we could do. And there's just a, a tremendous amount of excitement for the notion that they can get more and more value out of their data, they can make their data persuasive, um, and, and as I said, just use it in ways that they really hadn't thought about before. And, and you know, in terms of how we feel about it, that really resonates with us because we're kind of about the same thing. It's how do you bring this data together and use it in ways that you haven't been able to, to use it before. And then when you add Tableau on top of kind of the mission that we're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. it just kind of amplifies what, what we're able to do and what our customers are able to mm. do. Uh, and, and what is your thoughts, I'm not sure if you heard the keynote yesterday, but the CEO, Christian Shebo, talked about they're really going to invest heavily in R&D over the next two years. Now, you know, more than they have over the last 10 combined. Um, and that's saying something because they do already invest a lot in R&D. Um, do you agree with that strategy? Do you think you know, they're, they're growing quickly um, in terms of revenue, customers, employees, um, in terms of putting a lot of that money back in the company? Do you think that's the right approach for Tableau at this point in their growth? I love that idea. <laughs> I, I absolutely love that idea because I, I really, as, as big an impact as Tableau has had, I think we're at the beginning of this, um, of this journey. And there, there's so much more that can be done. And I think investing in R&D and investing in kind of understanding how to broaden out um, the types of data that can be accessed, the ways it can be done, uh, making it uh, even more intuitive and, and even easier for people to create these um, stories around their data. I, I really think we're at the beginning of that journey. So, you know, it's not my place to comment on Tableau's <laughs> strategy, but I think it's a great idea. Um, well, great, we have time for just one more question. Uh, so what's, what's next for MarkLogic? What's kind of on your roadmap for the next six, 12 months? What's top of mind for you in terms of uh, maybe the product development or overall strategy? Yeah, so, so in the next, um, uh, well, actually by the end of the year, we're releasing our next product, uh, MarkLogic 8, which is, um, you know, super exciting for us major investment in um, developer ease of use. So we're adding uh, lots of features to the product that um, will make it easier for people to use their existing skill sets, bring those to Mark Logic, bring all of the power of Mark Logic to folks who know JavaScript, folks who are in the uh, Node.js mm -hmm. world, really broadening out that, that user base, bringing enhancements to our semantics technology, which we introduced last year and has has been one of the most quickly adopted technologies in our history, super, super important, so we're, we're doubling down on semantics. And we're adding technologies like bitemporal, um, which is really cool, and actually um, uh, Tableau's been working with us to create uh, visualizations of bitemporal data. I'd love to spend a whole another 20 <laughs> minutes talking about just that, but really exciting area. So Mark Logic 8's the big thing on the horizon for us. All right, well, we'll look out for that, and I'm sure we're, our paths are going to cross at some other shows uh, in the near future. So Great. Joe Pascal from Mark Logic, thanks so much for joining us on theCUBE. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Thanks.